We're going to answer, well, not answer, we're going to look at sex, marriage, because this is a very important topic. There are two, I think, extreme views on sex. The one over here is what we call, I guess, sex is supreme. There was a, there was a band when I was growing up called the Bloodhound Gang that said a song, <laughs> Mel knows it, um, that sang a song that went along like this. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals, so let's do it like they do on the Discovery Channel. <laughs> that was the song. And that view of sex is basically saying, you're just a highly evolved ape. If you're hungry, eat. If you are itchy, scratch. If you want sex, do it. It doesn't matter, you're just an animal, really. Some animals, after they mate, the female eats the male, but not many people into that. <laughs> but basically that's it. If you want it, do it. That's it. So that's one extreme. The other extreme, is that sex is bad. That's the other extreme. Um, there is a book in the 19th century, I wish I was joking when I said this, uh, a Christian book, not really Christian, but I'll read you the title, which will take three hours. This is the title of the book. Instruction and advice for the young bride on the conduct and procedure of the intimate and personal relationship of the marriage state for the greater spiritual sanctity of the blessed sacraments and the glory of God. That's the title of the book. Sounds exciting, I know, by Ruth Smithers. No relation to Simpsons. And this is what it says. There's a Christian book saying this is what sex is. Sex is at best revolting and at worst painful. It has to be endured. Then says to the wives who are, who are married about sex, give little, give rarely, and above all, give grudgingly. Otherwise, what could, have, what, have, what could have been a proper marriage will become an orgy of sexual lust. So that's the other extreme, that sex is bad. So two views. Sex is God. It's who I am. I'm going to do it. Or the other extreme, sex is gross. What we want to look at tonight is that the Bible talks about sex as a gift that God created. So we're going to have a look at what um, God says about sex and he created it. Because think about it. If God created it, wouldn't it, he be the best person to look at what he says, how it works? Wouldn't he be the best person to ask when it goes wrong what, what went wrong? I mean, think about it. If, you, if I gave you an iPad 3 right now, I know someone won it because of the launch. Yes, I was going to enter that competition just to win that iPad. But if I gave you an iPad, now you could do a number of things with it. You could eat your dinner off it. Yeah? You could have it as a hat. You could also have it as a Frisbee. But that's not the best use of the iPad, yeah? If it breaks down... The best person to ask is not the person who owns the pet shop or the mechanic or your three-year-old sister. The best person to ask is the people that made it at the Mac shop. They're the people who created it. They know how it best works. They know what's wrong when it stuffs up. So the same is with God. We're going to ask him how sex works. If he created it, how's it going to be best used? So that's what we're going to have a look at. Um, we're going to pick up where it was read before. Let me give you a bit of context. God created the world, fills it with animals, creates Adam. Adam's job is then to number, oh, sorry, number, name the animals. So he's like, that's a cow. That's a camel. I don't know what that is. Platypus. And he's sort of naming the animals, yeah? And he's coming, you know, around and sort of seeing, naming all the animals, and he gets... Bit lonely, he's looking around, where's my partner? Where's the one made for me? He's like, well, there's a chimpanzee, bit hairy, but no, you know. He's sort of a bit lonely here. And then have a look what God does. Verse 21, I think it's on the screen. So the Lord caused, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs 
and closed up the place with flesh. Then God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Adam awakes and sees this beautiful, seeming naked, woman walking towards him. What does he say? Have a look. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. What they believe this is, it is actually, is a song. He sees a woman walking towards her, and what does he do? Bursts out into song. And since then, every guy who sees a girl that he's in love with writes a song, yeah? Because girls love it. Yes? What woman does not want the guy of her dreams singing her a song? It's biblical, yeah? He sees her, whoa, bursts out into song. This woman, she's for me. I'm not going to sing because it would be atrocious. But God creates guys, girls. Different, but equal. They're equal because they're both made in the image of God. That you, whether you're a guy or a girl, have purpose. That you have worth and that you have value despite what people have said. You have value, you have purpose and you have worth because you are made in the image of God. Now, it seems to me that almost all the guys are sitting over here and all the girls are sitting over there. Wow, that sort of worked out. So you're different, but equal. That you will always be a guy and you'll always be a girl. You're not like a, an animal that changes sex. Clownfish do this. I don't know if you know this. If there's not enough female clownfish, a male clownfish will change to be a female. Changes Finding Nemo completely. There's a sequel coming. Who knows what's going to be in it? (laughs) But you're a guy and you're a girl, and that's a great thing. God's created that. Both equal. Creates guys and girls. And then he creates marriage. Have a look. Verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. He's saying, first of all, guys, you need to step up. You need to take responsibility. You need to initiate You need to be able to provide for the woman. He's not saying he's saying you've got to have provide more than your call of duty skills. Yeah, you've got to have be responsible and step up. Leaving your parents, and then he says, and be united to his wife. This united is saying is it's a lifelong commitment. This is we're going to commit together, be with each other. Forever, till death. So be united and that they will become one flesh. Yeah, next one actually. Is there the next one? And they'll become one flesh. What's saying is this, God creates and has created sex. It was his idea that God creates sex. It's not like he created Adam and Eve, went away and came back, whoa, what are you doing? You know, it's not, it wasn't a shock. Yeah? It's not like he was like, well, I didn't know I could do that. You know, he created sex. He created guys and girls to be different as a unifying act. And you know what's amazing? You know what's amazing? God created sex to be unifying. And biologically, when you have sex, there's a chemical that's released called oxytocin. It's the same chemical that's released in part when uh, a newborn baby is breastfeeding, that bond between a mother and a newborn. At a greater level, when you have sex, you actually, that chemical's released, so you're unified. So sex is created by God to be unifying, to be pleasurable, and to be enjoyed in marriage. And then it finished off with, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Anybody think that's weird? You know, they're naked and felt no shame. But what that is saying is this, is that they could stand opposite each other, completely naked, without being embarrassed. I mean, if I was standing here naked, I'd be embarrassed and you'd be terrified. But (laughs) it's saying they're naked and there's trust. To stand in front of someone naked is actually a very trustworthy thing. So... 
But it means more than that. It's saying that they will be able to share each other's desires, passions, that they could be one, that there was so much trust between them that there's no embarrassment, that there's no shame, that there's no guilt, but there's trust that they're naked and felt no shame. But then you move over to question, uh, chapter three and things go completely different. The serpent asks Adam Eve and says, you know, did God really say dot, 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 And friends, we have been asking that question ever since. Did God really say, and we fill in the blank, that Adam and Eve believed that God was ripping them off, that somehow he'd given them sex, he'd given them intimacy, he'd given them uh, marriage, but God was ripping them off. And they decided, you know what? I'm going to be God. I'm going to say what I think sex, marriage, love is all about. And we do the exact same thing. We say, did God really say that men and women are equal? Did God really say that guys shouldn't take responsibility? And you look around and you see guys using, abusing, at worst, rape. I think it's about one in every three children will go to bed tonight without a dad, because the dad has left, didn't want to take responsibility? Did God really say you had to be united to your wife? I mean, why not just get divorced? We're not in love anymore. Did God really say you have to have sex with the opposite gender? Did God really say you have to be married to just one person? Did God really say that marriage is permanent and lifelong? Did God really say that you just have to have sex in marriage? What about before marriage? What about fooling around? What about porn? I mean, it's not hurting anyone. Did God really say, and then we fill in the blank. And then worst of all, we say, did God really say that sex is good? Did God really say that marriage is good? And we, in our own ways, try and be God. And we think, God... You invented it, but you didn't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. And God gives us over to what we want, and we must suffer the consequences. Because we live in a world where families are breaking down, where marriages are ending in adulteries and affairs. There's sexual disease, there's shame, regret, embarrassment. There's distrust, there's sexual abuse, there's sexual slavery. There's addiction. And I know that most of us here have experienced one of those things in one shape or another. That we look at our families, that we look at our friends' families, our parents, our friends' parents' marriages, and they're breaking down. And God has given us what we wanted, that we want to be in control. And he said, well, if that's the case, then you must live in a world full of shame and guilt. But you know what the amazing thing is? Is that when I think about what I would do in response, if I was God and I'd created this whole great world, given them such things as sex and marriage and, and, and love, and then people turn around and said, stuff you, I want to be in control. My instinct would be, God. Dead. That's it. See you later. Yeah? That's my instinct. I'm pretty sure it would be yours. Maybe you'd be a bit slower but at annihilating them. But God's first instinct is that he's full of compassion. His first instinct is to give more. In fact, he gives himself. That he sees that we are living in guilt and shame and regret. And you know what? He does something about it. Not only at the cross where Jesus dies, does Jesus say, you know what, I'm going to take your rebellion, I'm going to take your rejection onto myself. But he says, I am going to remove your guilt. I'm going to remove your shame. I'm going to remove everything that you have done and put it on myself. There is a great psalm, which I want to read just a bit of. It's on the screen. Psalm 51. Bear in mind, this is a guy, David, 
Here's a Christian who committed adultery, saw a woman he wanted. She was married. He was married. He wanted her, slept with her to cover it up, killed her husband. A lot of sin, a lot of regret, a lot of shame. This is what he says. Cleanse me with hyssop, which is kind of like a, like a branch, like a cloth, I guess you'd say. And I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create to me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Friends, you may feel dirty, but Jesus makes you clean. Whiter than snow. And you might be saying, James, you don't know what I've done. And I would just say, you do not know what Jesus has done for you. Jesus takes your guilt and shame onto himself if you would just let him. That you are made new. That no longer can, do you see yourself if you accept what he has done. No longer do you see yourself as the porn addict, as the skank, as the girl or guy who lost their virginity quite early, as the person who was abused, as the person who has cheated or lied. You see yourself as loved by Jesus and you see yourself in what he has done for you, not what you were. That Jesus wipes away and continues to wipe away our mess. And the glorious thing is that not only does he do this, but he gives us, by the Holy Spirit, the ability to say no to what we think we want and yes to God's original plan. He actually, if you accepted him, lives in you and wants you for the first time to say, you know what, God? I want to go back to what you wanted. I want to go back to the original plan. I want to actually wait, as crazy as it might sound, not to have sex until marriage, until the point that you wanted it, in a relationship full of trust, without shame, without regret, in commitment, that Jesus Christ enables us to live a new life, to think new things when it comes to dating, when it comes to relationships. He enables us to say no to sin and yes to following him. Friends, what we're going to do now is, I presume Matt has got some questions. Yes. But I'm first, I'm actually just going to stop and pray. Some of you here tonight... um, have realized that you have rejected what God wanted in different ways. And you need to do business with him. You need, because he is willing, he is wanting to change and transform you. Others have realized that you've a Christian, been a Christian for a while, and you need to do business with him. You have rejected him in different ways, and he continues to forgive So I'm going to pray now. If you want, make this prayer your own. All you need to say is amen at the end. I agree. So I'm going to pray. And that remind us what Jesus has done for us. How he renews everything. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Well, firstly, we are sorry that we have rejected your way, Lord. That we think that we know best. And even now, there may be thoughts that we have that are still rejecting you and we continually reject you, Lord, but we thank you that despite us, you love us. Despite our rejection, despite what we've done, despite what we will do, you love us. And we thank you, Jesus, that you wipe away our sin. We are no longer dirty, but we are clean in you. I pray for people here now, Lord, who at this moment are sitting in their chair and are feeling guilt, condemnation and embarrassment, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they would 
come to you knowing that you embrace them, that you love them, that you want the best for them, that you want to restore and renew them. I pray for us all, Lord, that we will see sex, marriage, and love the way you see it. And we thank you for what you've done. Amen.